Yo, welcome to BT Sport Takeover. For those of you who've never seen it, it's where BT Sport hand over the car keys to us, the generation who can't afford driving lessons, let alone a polluting piece of metal with four wheels. <laughs> so click on your seatbelts and turn up the tracks. And don't forget your L plates. No, 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 no. Let's ditch the L plates. We're gonna do this like the petrol head rude boys. Volume up, tires popping, revving our engines loud and proud. And you might think this kind of intro means half an hour of high-octane, youth-centric, brat-based, Gen Z nonsense. But you'd be wrong. Like they say, don't judge a book by its cover. You see, we're actually very serious. We care about the planet, especially the issues we see around us in society. The subjects of the next three films you see focus on sport issues that we have chosen to show you. We went to visit an organisation who take in second-hand bikes, refurbish them, and then donate them to refugees in the UK. What you're going to hear about today... Bicycles are everywhere in Oxford. It's nothing short of a miracle. It is the easiest and most sustainable way to get about. But not everyone has a bicycle. The solution? Well, volunteers across town are joining forces to give more people the freedom of cycling. One of the beauties of this project is what an amazing collaborative effort this is. Sanctuary Wheels started in early 2022 and it's a partnership effort between a whole load of different organisations. So we've had ourselves involved, Asylum Welcome, Cyclox, who are a fantastic volunteer, cycling charity, Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue, all involved in giving out over 500 bikes to asylum seekers and refugees right across the county. I think it's a really, really important project because at the moment I see it emblematic of two different forces at play. Internationally, there's an amazing amount of conflicts and wars and issues that are forcing many, many people, perhaps at unprecedented levels, to leave and escape. At the moment, there are about 100 million displaced people around the world, and of those, about 50% are children. Often these people experience really traumatic journeys. Nationally, we're seeing a very, an increasingly hostile environment. The UK is really trying to make life as difficult and challenging and welcoming as possible. And I think projects like Sanctuary Wheels uh, and working together with the community is a little but very important effort trying to help. So I'm here joined with NASA. We are at his workshop where he reconditioned his bikes and gives out to refugees. Welcome to my workshop. It's uh, bikes for refugees. We get them donated from all types and we collect them here, do them up. We organize them and distribute them accordingly. We've heard so many stories like of the benefit and the impact that Sanctuary Wheels has had over the last year. I think one that really stands out for me is Max, who came here from Ukraine, and I think in like April or May 2022. He was given a bike through the Sanctuary Wheels project, and he says that for him it's been about connections. It's meant that he can visit his friends that have also come from Ukraine. He can go to language cafes, GP appointments, health appointments, but it's given him that extra confidence. And from when I first met him um, to how he is a few months down the line of sort of settling into this country and the bike's been a huge part of that. His story is amazing and it's what I think Sanctuary Wheels was all about. When you're in bicycle, you are more feel that you control your life. It's a feeling of independence. You, you use this opportunity to go to the work or to go to the volunteering. Uh, allow that you are start to feel yourself part of a society. That you see all uh, cycling and you are cycling. You are normal, I don't know. I also heard that you have some magic going on upstairs. Oh yes, our uh, magic workshop. This is our workshop, our magician. He's uh, joined us recently and hopefully will be helping us through the years. So when did you start? What, doing bikes? Doing bikes. Oh gosh, about 25 years ago. I started seeing uh, discarded and wrecked bikes that had been thrown out, literally in the rubbish, and putting them together. So when I'm making bikes out of different parts from different bikes on it, it's a bit of a Franken bike. It's just sort of recycling, you know, putting so making something useful out of other people's chuckouts. But these bikes, they don't go to the dumpsters, right? <laughs> At one point I had 60, 60 bikes in my garage. 
So all the, the stuff on the trays over there all came out of my shed. It's nice to have a, a large space to work in and get going on bikes for, for asylum seekers and refugees. This is something that's always been really close to my heart. My dad's a refugee. We came here when I was 13, about to turn 14, and we lived through the Iran-Iraq war. But despite that, the first year we were in England was one of the hardest I think my family has ever experienced. You know, imagine you've left everyone and everything you know and love behind, and you might have also had some traumatic experiences of war and conflict. And for example, in my father's case, having been in prison, and you're in a new place where you don't know the language and it feels like, you know, when I arrived at school, it felt like there was a heavy curtain separating those of us who were new from everyone else. And the response we got from the Sanctuary Wheels project just really sings to what the people of Oxfordshire and Oxford are like. The generosity and the kindness that people have shown, it's really remarkable. Oxford is an incredibly friendly cycling city and so I think that's why Sanctuary Wheels has gone down so well. Oxford, it's amazing town. The main problem for me, it was the left side. Cycling <laughs> on the left side yes, of the road. Yes. yes. Definitely, you can't live without a bike in Oxford. It just gives you that freedom. You can see in their eyes like happiness. Oxford are trying to become a, uh, you know, a carbon neutral city. Um, and little by little, we're moving towards that goal. I believe that cycling is good for our health, for our mental health, and as well for the environment. So you told me you have a son and a daughter. Yes, three of us, we go to bikes from Asalam Welcome. For them, a bike is a symbol of freedom. And I think that's something that we often take for granted and that we should remember just having the possibility to have that sense of control over one's own life and be able to move around is really crucial to help someone be able to live a much better life. What an incredible outfit, combining a bit of sustainability, a bit of inclusivity, and creating a great community. That's one film down. Now do you see how serious we are? Serious and professional. Total and utter pros. That's why this is the first year that BT Sport didn't have to cough up for real presenters. They left it to us. We have literally taken over. Take over. Yep, no pros in this show. The whole crew, from lighting to sound, to directing and camera. For everyone here, we come from the same place. Hello. Back to us. Thanks. Please keep the cameras focused on me. <sighs> Next up, this is one that hit home to a lot of us students in this takeover course. You see, there's a bit of a problem with hiking in Britain. It's too frosty at the top of the mountain. Over the last few years, sport has become ever more democratic. We've seen a growth in inclusion in many sports at all levels from amateur to professional. But there is one sport popular all over the UK that lacks diversity, and that's hiking. One person is trying to change that. We followed Harun Motain to the walls of the Peak District where his group of Muslim hikers are seeking to foster a real sense of community in the mountains. But we need to ask, why does an organization like Muslim Hikers have to exist in the first place? I'm Harun Mota, the founder of Active Inclusion Network and Muslim Hikers. I started running about 10 years ago when I signed up to run the 2012 London Marathon in the spirit of the 2012 London Olympics. I actually told myself I'd never run again. I had such a horrible, painful experience. My life was turned upside down the following year when I lost my father. I found myself reflecting on myself, my life and where I was. And it was after that that I decided that I wanted to keep the running shoes on to run for good causes in my father's memory. Muslim Hikers was founded during the pandemic. It has now become the largest community in the world for Muslims who are interested in the outdoors. Our mission is very much to try and encourage, inspire and empower more ethnic minority communities to get outside to take care of their well-being. It's for the community, it's getting outside. It's a lot of fun away from the usual nine to five schedule. I've never been on a hike before. <laughs> so um, when Aisha told me about this, I live in Denmark, she was like, come here and I booked a flight. Just do it. I've been exploring and adventuring the British countryside for nearly 20 years now. Very rarely I would bump into people that looked like me, people of South Asian background or people of the Muslim community in general. For someone that lives in Coventry, which is a very diverse city, not seeing that same diversity reflected in the countryside 
seemed, seemed rather odd. I think it certainly raised awareness if it wasn't for Muslim hikers because it gives a safe space where there's other guides and others who can help provide that safe environment to go up on a hike that we wouldn't have normally done before. Having worked for a long time for the Peak District National Park, um, you know, it, is, it, it is full of people like me, but um, obviously the surrounding cities and the UK population are, are far more diverse than that. When, oh, I wanted to do something for the communities I represent to try and encourage more people to get outside in these spaces. And I love the outdoors. I love that it brings me therapy. I love that it clears my mind. Today's walk should be approximately five to six hours. It's about seven miles in distance. We're walking together as a group. Some take more time than others. We have enough mountain guides to ensure that people can walk confidently and comfortably. We don't want people to feel like it's too much of a struggle and that they're having to rush. So it's about having a good time. It's not about reaching a particular summit. So it's going to be a great day. Let's go. We were a little apprehensive at this point, especially after Harun had pointed out the hike was over seven miles long and went 550 meters up. But we'd committed. We would follow him all the way on his hike, so we dug deep and began the trek. Long way to go. You can see all of the people climbing up there already. That's how far we've got to go. <laughs> can you see that man on the top of up there? Can you see him? That's where we're going. This is your first time hiking too, right? My first time walking properly. First time walking properly. You can imagine being here on a different day when there's no cloud and how much further you can see. Every experience in the outdoors is unique and it's great that you can, you know, enjoy it with people as well, so. According to a 2021 Statista study, it's Buddhists, Christians, Jews or Sikhs who are more likely to be physically active, whilst the levels of physical activity fall with those from the Muslim faith. It's difficult to really measure impact on faith because faith is something which is very personal. Our events are for community spirit, bringing people together. And community itself is a huge pillar of our faith. And, you know, we believe, you know, humanity being one. And the connections that are being made through these hiking events, they are so inclusive. We have people traveling from different parts of the country. We spread peace, we spread love, we pray together, we eat together. And, you know, when you share, care and love one another, that itself is a form of worship. And that's one of the beautiful values and virtues of our faith. We've just finished our prayer break. Uh, for us Muslims, it's really important for us to uh, maintain our prayer. It's one of the fundamentals of our faith. We pray five times a day. And whilst out hiking, uh, it infringes upon two of our afternoon prayer times. It's often a worry for, for Muslims coming out on a hike like this. If we want to be inclusive, it's so important that we make accommodations for such. I can't count on my hands like how many people I've met this today. It's, yeah. it's, been, yeah. a, it's been wild. And amazing. we all just prayed together and that was beautiful. Yeah. That was amazing. You wouldn't see such a big group of us in the countryside. Um, we do stick out like a bit of sore thumb and there's no need really. I mean, we work everywhere. We're in the NHS, we're in teaching, we're in schools. We are absolutely everywhere. So why is it that we feel uncomfortable to come out into the countryside? Really, we should be allowed to be able to feel comfortable coming on these kind of hikes. We shouldn't have to feel vulnerable. We shouldn't have to feel no. scared. We shouldn't have to, you know, feel sort of alone and isolated. Mm. But coming together as a family, I think, making that change and coming together with Muslim hikers, definitely, her is definitely making an impact. This is our first winter walk of the season. It's been an amazing day, meeting so many people from different parts of the country. In fact, someone came to me at the end of the walk and told me they came all the way from Denmark. And I was like, you what? You've come from Denmark? Things like that that make what I do uh, here at Muslim Hikers. So rewarding. We hope that more people can see our work. People that are watching this hopefully feel more inspired and compelled to come and embrace the beautiful outdoors and enjoy it. We got this. Live life, no regrets, guys. Rahima, you looked rough. I don't see you climbing up a mountain. <laughs> I don't know why you guys are at it, but anyways, moving on. That hike, it seemed so crazy, but sick at the same time. It really did. But Rahima, for you, what was the best part of that experience? Best part? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, considering it was my first shoot and my first hike, I mean, I'm not much of a walker, let alone a hiker. So I'm not going to lie, halfway up, I was this close to turning back. But I just knew this wasn't a moment to give up and go down. 
So the community spirit and the help of my crew, it all became my fuel. And you know what? It's true what they say. The views at the top, they really do pay off. But in the film, the praying against the backdrop of the mountain, that seemed almost poetic. Honestly, that was the most beautiful scene I have ever witnessed. Those shots in the film, they still bring me to tears. Yeah, man. As a fellow Muslim, it definitely touched my heart. I could feel all those emotions through the screen and that sense of ummah, you know, Muslim togetherness. It really made me feel at home. And who said Gen Z couldn't get deep? We've got more films that mean the world to us after the break. See you in five. Welcome back. If we touched your hearts with the last film, then get your tissues ready for this one as we head north to spend the day with a truly extraordinary gentleman. Look how happy you look. You all right? These people are saying to me, here's my life. Can you help me? Out in the real world, people judge you, whereas Javino has never judged me from day one. People get taught that strength is how much you can lift and how much this and that, how much you look like. That ain't strength. The people that I deal with that are going through severe disabilities, that have been through cancer and strokes, they're not fighting battles that are un unimaginable. You want your stick, Tom? No. no. I'm Javino, owner of the world famous J7 Health Centre. Now do it properly, OK, you lot of sausage. Go on. Really? Yeah, good girl. Yeah. Hey, me yeah. I started this health centre because, one, I felt like I had a gift for helping people. I wanted to change a few things. I didn't like the way gyms made people feel. It can be a quite lonely place, it can be a quite intimidating place. I got sick of the way disabled people and elderly people were being treated. As regards to the patronising nature, people spoke to him, and I wanted to change that as well. OK, back down. 15 years ago in my mum's kitchen, I've written on a piece of paper exactly what you see today. I'm, I'm a big believer of normality. You come in, let me know your story, you know my story. We become brethren, we become friends, we become family. you got me for life. Go on, Josh. Go on, Nassau. Keep going on the way. Go on, go on, Josh. One of my happiest moments was the first time Josh... I remember Josh said to me that he's, uh, I think the most... He's, he stood up for about 10, 15 seconds. But when Josh stands up because of his condition, his legs go. His little legs go like that. You see, his little eyebrows go. He's like, yo. And I said, you know what? We're going to stand up long today. And we stood up for around 30 seconds. Go on, go on, son. And his legs were going, and then all of a sudden his legs said, Yo, you built stronger than that, you built different. Yeah, and his legs just stopped shaking. Yeah, and I was give me five. Gasped, because that was the first time that he stood up. And his uh, and his legs, yeah, his legs stopped shaking. That was major. <laughs> Two yeah. and ten. This whole space is like a big um, community. Because um, a lot of the time a gym can be quite over, um, can, um, can be very overwhelming, and this is very small and it's very intimate, and and like every time you come here, um, like it's like you can come away and it's like you've made a friend. When you come in here, like he just makes it about the individual. He doesn't look at what you can't do. He looks at what you can do and how he can push it. The kind of people that I deal with, you can't, you can't have no bad days. They've been through some of the most traumatic things that humans can go through. So this is a letter that I received from a, a young man. I say young man because I'm 37, this man's not, not far off my age, a couple of years older, who's he's got terminal cancer. He has been told maybe six, seven months he's got to live, and he's chosen me to... Uh, I feel honoured that some people choose me to, to spend them few months with. 
Javina helped me a lot with my confidence and just instilled in me that just because I'm disabled, that doesn't mean anything, because anything is possible. I've learned to shave with my left and I've learned, I've learned to write. So until I get this going, I know I'm there then. My work's gone global. And for what? For treating people normal. All I'm doing is treating people nice, making people laugh, making people feel welcome, and putting a smile on someone's face who's going through a bad time. Uh, I was getting a bit of help off the local council, but it was only on paper. You used to give it me on A4 and leave me and go through the door. So I inquired and someone said, try the gym. What gym? And they told me I wasn't getting the, the, the help I needed. And some people today are still not getting it. So they just give up. The plan was never to open a facility that was just for them. It was just to open a facility that was for the community. And it's just naturally turned into a place of a bit of a sanctuary for people with disability and people with, who are elderly. I think it's great. I mean, people doing things, going out and involving people who aren't normally involved is, a, is an excellent thing. Local authorities are finding it very difficult at the moment to find money to look after elderly people who need care. There is extraordinary competition for finance and resources. I wasn't comfortable with people travelling from so far for a 30 minute session. But then I come to realise after a strong conversation with my older brother that they're travelling because they need it. Travelling because where they live or their community there's probably nothing of this sort in their community and they're travelling because they require it. I've told everyone and people have come. Can't beat Javino, there's, there's not many like him. Well, if he's won four awards, continuous, he's something about the man. For the future, for disabled and elderly people, simply normality. Engage, encourage them, talk to them, motivate them, let them be a part of everything. Just include people and treat people normal. That's what I'd love the most, because I've seen the power of basic care and basic positivity. So hopefully, we can get that out a little bit more. Oh, that was deep. If you think that was emotional, imagine being there. It left me in tears. I mean, it definitely gave me goosebumps. Personally, I was heart touched and amazed by the dedication that everyone showed. It put all of my worries and my problems into perspective. I mean, my eyes have truly been opened. Whew. Okay, so that covers three areas there. Community, inclusivity and sustainability three subjects that mean a lot to us and we hope that they mean something to you guys too. And maybe, just maybe, you have gained a slightly different opinion on what really matters to us young people today. So, I guess that wraps up TakeOver for another year. This journey has been crazy, but I guess all good things must come to an end. I mean, <laughs> you never know. We did so good we might actually get paid to be here next time. Hopefully. Okay, enough. I've got to run. But don't worry, we'll leave you with a banger. Salam alaikum. Good shmikas are there. BT Sport Takeover. You're locked in with your boy Kimbo. Searching. Let's get it. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. Listen. Sis, she had a boyfriend in the middle of the week But she cut that brother off, she won't get in any sleep Yeah, I see a diamond in a rough, where I mean From another city, but she made my chest go weak Say she saw my gram, can't lie that I play her Like a past life, she been messing with some players Love gone wrong many times, she afraid I was raised by my mama, so baby, it's okay But she said, nah, was the love ever real from the start? If she trusts, will I just break her heart? She had a Utah, I had it in the car, uh, car, uh, yeah Long time I'm the man where she's searching for She ain't hurt no more Loving when I'm talking to her nasty Says she want love some more Long time I'm the man where she's searching for oh, Hurt no more, ain't hurt no more Loving when I'm talking to her nasty Says she want love some more Like past true or more like it. Tell me something make we jay Or give a reason for your front face 
Everything I do give you my green Oh yeah Up on me Jack I love my loving Makes you warm my lover Yeah yeah If I do when's your turn Was the love ever real from the start? If she trusts, will I just break her heart? She had a Utah that I did in a car, uh, car, uh, yeah. Long time I'm the man where she's searching for. She ain't hurt no more. Loving when I'm talking to her nasty, so she want love some more. Long time I'm the man where she's searching for. Uh, hurt no more, ain't hurt no more. Loving when I'm talking to her nasty, so she want love some more. Take over.